a GT championship. There are 11 rounds in all, so we're about halfway through. And Simon Taylor's with me. Simon, what's the verdict so far? Well, it's turned into a wonderful three-way battle between three major manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz, BMW in the shape of McLaren and Porsche. Now, so far, the McLarens have been doing most of the winning, but I think as we go into the second half of the season, you'll see these still very new CLK Mercedes going quicker and quicker. It's going to be a great battle, I think, through to the end. Porsche not quite on the pace, and Paynars and Lotus just picking up the bits uh, when they happen to appear. GT2, another manufacturer battle, because it's Chrysler with the Vipers versus all those Porsches. The Vipers seem to be the quickest on the fast circuits, as you would expect from those big 8-litre V10 engines. On the twistier circuits, like here in Austria, the nimble Porsche seem to have the pace, so that's a fascinating battle as well. What about the standard of the driving? Is it good? Well, you really have three different types of drivers in GT racing. You have the supreme professionals, people like JJ Leto, who've done Formula One racing, who are very quick, but very safe, who know that it is an endurance race, you have to keep going to the end. You have the young hot shoes, I won't mention any names, but you've seen them here on ITV doing their stuff, and sometimes they do get into trouble. And then you've got the gentleman drivers, who sometimes seem a little bit out of their depth, but they're very important, they bring a lot of money into the sport. And that is really part of the challenge of endurance racing. You have to be able to cope with lots of different types of drivers as you work your way through the traffic. It's all part of the skill needed to win these races. OK, thanks, Simon. We'll give you a chance now to nip to the commentary box. We, of course, have been following the British drivers mainly, and they've done us proud. Steve Soper leading the GT1 Championship and Justin Bell on top of the GT2 Championship. Let's find out now how they'll line up for this race in Austria. This was the incredible scene at the last meeting. All three Golf McLarens crashing into each other on the very first lap. As a direct result of that incident, the French driver Jean-Marc Gounon, seen here explaining his view of the crash, has been rested. So now experienced Englishman Jeff Lees, partners Andrew Gilbert Scott, and Anders Olofsson will drive with Pierre-Henri Raffinel. Other changes here include Porsche bringing in Scotsman Alan McNish to partner Yannick Dalmas. That's in place of Hans Stuck, and they were quick in qualifying. I think realistically we can look at a podium position. We're fifth on the grid, and at Spa, the previous race, uh, the Porsche was very competitive in race trim, more than in qualifying trim, and I think round here we should be in a similar situation. But it's Mercedes dominating again. They seem to get stronger at each round. The CLKs are 1-2-3 on the grid here at the A1 ring, led by Alessandro Nannini. Starting fourth in the BMW McLaren, championship leaders JJ Leto and Steve Soper. But Steve isn't a fan of the new track. It's, uh, it's too, too slow, too many first and second gear corners. And it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's not demanding enough like having fast corners. You won't mind it too much if you win, though? No, I probably think it's a lovely circuit if we win. <laughs> The usually reliable Parabolica team have problems in practice. They'll start this one down in 17th place on the grid. We've actually got a bit more work to do this time since we had a bad two qualifying sessions. So we've definitely got it all to do today. And I, I'm optimistic that we can do something. It's really, I think this race is actually going to, if you're at, there at the end, then you're going to get a result. So the first corner will be interesting. Paynells were in the top 10 last time, so many eyes on their pit. David Brabham and Perry McCarthy start 14th, well ahead of their teammates James Weaver and Andy Wallace, but never try an interview with Brabham and McCarthy loitering. We normally see you ahead of the other Paynells, and it's the other way around this, this time. What's been the problem? Oh, I think there must be some kind of mistake. I think they got the, the grid sheet up the wrong way. I was going as fast as I could, and it all went horribly wrong. In actual fact... <laughs> In GT2, Olivier Beretta and Philippe Gash were quickest. Championship leader Justin Bow starts fourth and has yet another partner, the experienced veteran Dieter Cuesta. To drive with Dieter here in, in Austria is obviously uh, quite, a, quite a first for me. And as my dad said, God, you might as well be driving with me. <laughs> Dieter, you're tremendously experienced. I think you've driven with Justin's dad, haven't you? Yeah, uh, I think two years or three years ago in Daytona, and uh, I drove a lot of races with his father, so uh, uh, I must say Bell is a name for me, uh, uh, which is good for a podium. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so is Quester, I hope. <laughs> so. 
three Mercedes, Nanini Schneider and Ludwig leading the rest of the 36 car field round on the rolling lap up to the rolling start. It's very hot, track temperatures of over 40 degrees centigrade, and this is going to be a long and hard and hot race. We're riding with Pierre Henri Raphael in his McLaren. The race is on. We go down the start, finish straight, and those three Mercedes are out in front. It's Schneider. Schneider has got the lead. It's Schneider from Nanini with Ludwig in third place. The rest of the field pouring through. But JJ Leto has got the McLaren up into fourth place. Then it's three of the Porsches and uh, the Gulf McLaren of Pierre Henri Raphael, the one with the cockpit camera we were riding with a second ago, is in eighth place. There are those two yellow lotuses well up behind the black dams, Penos, but already. Bernd Schneider has pulled away from his two teammates. Bernd Schneider already building a lead on this first lap from Nanini and Ludwig. There is Leto in fourth place. And we ride with Pierre-Henri Raphael as Dalmas and Collard battle in their Porsches ahead of us. And let's ride now with Raphael in the 600 horsepower McLaren. Through that long left-hander. And you can see how quick the gear changes are with this uh, sequential gear change. He just pushes the gear lever forward or back to go up and down. There, forward to go up a gear. And he's looking in his mirror. And I can tell you the reason why he's looking in his mirror is because the white BMW entered McLaren of Roberto Ravaglia is right behind him as they go through that tight uh, right-hander onto the start for his straight. He's looking in his mirror. Ravaglia is up alongside. They're side by side as they go down the start for his straight. Flat out is Raphael. Flat out is Ravaglia on the brakes now. And is Ravaglia going through? He is. Ravaglia sneaks through on the inside and accelerates away up the hill. This may be a long four-hour race, but the battles are going on all the way down the field. Schneider, Nanini and Ludwig in their Mercedes, the first three. Leto's McLaren fourth, then the three Porsches. Wallach, Collard in the red car, Dalmas, then the two McLarens that we've been watching battle with Ravaglia ahead now of Raphael and Schneider building, building this lead. Schneider very much the leader of this three-car Mercedes team. He's the best-placed Mercedes driver in the championship, and he is very much the blue-eyed boy in that team. And look at this lead he's building while Manini and Ludwig play the defensive strategy behind him to try and keep the McLarens and the Porsches behind. It's the yellow mirrored car of Schneider that leads, and you can always tell these Mercedes by the color of their mirrors. That's how the pits identify them. There's the blue mirrored car in second place of Nanini, the red mirrored car of Ludwig in third place, and JJ Leto, as he has been consistently throughout this GT season, the quickest of all the McLarens. And Porsche, Panos and Lotus getting very, very close indeed. The Lotus is almost spinning. That's Baldrini's Lotus almost tripping over the Panos of Andy Wallace. And we got a very early pit stop for Yannick Dalmas. This is the seventh place Porsche, which has come in after only a handful of laps. Now, what are they doing to that car? They're doing something in the cockpit. Is it the seat belts? It's the seat itself, apparently. It seems that the seat has come loose in that car, and that's no joke at all when you're driving around here at speeds of up to 185 miles an hour. Meanwhile, the leader goes smoothly and domineeringly on his way. That is the GT2 leader, the white and blue-striped Viper of Olivier Beretta. And just behind it, if you see a yellow flash, that will be the Marcos of the Dutchman Cor Oizer, second at the moment in the GT2 class and uh, a phalanx of the little GT2 Porsches with the leading Mercedes lapping them, working its way through the traffic. Schneider, of course, still at the wheel. That's Norbert Haug in the sunglasses, the competition's boss of Mercedes, watching his team run at the front of this race here at the A1 ring in Austria. That's Gary Ailes's Parabolica McLaren. It's stationary, there's wreckage, and Mike Hesselman's running away from the Lotus, which is on fire. That Lotus is burning badly, and Gary Ailes still inside the McLaren. Now the door's opening. Gary Ailes scrambling out of the McLaren, but the Lotus well and truly ablaze. No fire marshals yet. Where are the fire marshals? We've got yellow flags, but that Lotus burning badly. Now there's a fire truck there. But that Lotus very much on fire. 
I wonder if this is going to call for a safety car. That's Chris Goodwin talking to David Morrison, the uh, patron of the Parabolica team, and poor Chris Goodwin distraught to see that the Parabolica car, which has been doing so well this season, uh, is obviously out. There's Gary Ailes with the blonde hair talking to the burly figure of Mike Hesemans, the Dutchman, who was driving the Lotus. They're both quite clearly unhurt. We see it again. The McLaren spins, I think possibly because it was touched by John Nielsen's McLaren, which it was battling with. And as it spins, Hesemans' Lotus caught it. Hesemans running away from the car, realizing that it is stranded and well on fire. Well, they've got the far out now, but the car is still on the track as indeed is the Parabolica McLaren, and it has brought out the safety car. So, uh, Bert Schneider at the head of the queue that is building up behind the safety car, but it means that that lead has melted away. Gary, what happened? Uh, well, going into this first corner here, I mean, uh, John must have missed a gear or something coming out of this one, and he, I was on the outside. He came down the inside, actually gave him room. I didn't turn into him. And he gave me a smack on the way through. He couldn't help it because he committed to the corner, I guess. But he gave me a whack, put me on the curb and spun. And then the Lotus hit the front of the car. The safety car has parked once more. The race is on again. And still Mercedes 1, 2, 3. But as we've gone through the pit stops, it's Klaus Ludwig, who is now the second Mercedes. Still Bert Schneider leading. Ludwig in second place. Alessandra Nanini is third. Behind the trio of Silver Arrows, JJ Leto in the McLaren. You saw him there. He's in fourth place. Then the Porsche of Bob Wallach is fifth. Roberto Rovaglia's McLaren is sixth. And in GT2, it's a Porsche leading. The Italian Stefan Ortelli leads the Vipers, but there's still a very long way to go here in Austria at the A1 ring. Austria at the A1 ring, into the pits comes the Bruno Eichmann GT2 Porsche. It's got damage to the front right, a puncture at the very least, and that's going to drop it out of third place in that class. Good news for Justin Bell and Dieter Cuesta, who will move up to third in the GT2 class. Meanwhile, a great three-car battle for sixth place. All three of them are McLarens. Peter Cox, who's taken his car over from Roberto Rivaglia. Pierori Raffanel, who we're riding with now. And his teammate, Andrew Gilbert Scott, in the other Gulf car, who's right behind him. Three McLarens running together. That's Rivaglia on the right. Steve Soper on the left, waiting to take over from Leto. One of the Lotuses is coming to a halt. And Peter Cox has gone off. Peter Cox is in the gravel. I don't know what happened there, but Peter Peter Cox's car has come to a halt. There's a tractor going to drag it out. What a shame. It looks as though that car may be out. We're seeing a replay now. He's lapping the Ricitelli Porsche. Oh, and there's contact there. The Porsche just simply drove into the side of Peter Cox, spun him round. The Porsche goes round through the gravel, and this is Peter Cox's eye view. He comes up to lap the Porsche. The Porsche gives him lots of room and then turns in. Bang! at the back and the McLaren spins off into the gravel and I think the Dutchman Peter Cox must be absolutely furious about that a completely unnecessary accident now the leaders in the pit lane Schneider balked by the Chamberlain Viper a little bit in the pit lane Schneider comes in the leader comes in and Alex Burks is standing that tall figure waiting to get in out gets Schneider and now somehow sliding into that cockpit goes Alex Wurtz. Alex Wurtz is in there, and what are we seeing now? We're seeing another Lotus on fire. That's the Sandy Grau Kurt Tim Lotus. It's a slow motion replay. We see the driver rolling out of the cockpit and onto the grass as the marshals get there with their fire extinguishers. Nobody hurt happily, but another Lotus is out of the race. Meanwhile, Alex Burtz has settled comfortably into the cockpit of that leading Mercedes, and he's maintaining that lead at Bert Schneider. But we've got a Gulf McLaren in the pit lane now. It's damaged. That's the Andrew Gilbert Scott car. What has happened to Andrew? The car was going well. We were getting right up there. The car was handling pretty well. And, um, and just going out after the pit stop, I hit the, the uh, Armco coming out. It felt like there was some oil or some water down there because the other Lotus had caught fire. But... But whatever happens, obviously I feel responsible for doing it, so it's just incredibly annoying. So we ride now with Alex Wurtz, who is lapping Pierre-Henri Raffanel in the other Gulf McLaren. 
sister to the Andrew Gilbert Scott car, but in fact he's not lapping it yet as they go up the hill and into the right-hander. Raphael decides he's going to keep the leading Mercedes behind him for a bit. For a bit. And Alex Wurtz, you can see his hand briefly in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, working away at the wheel as he lines up to find a way to go past the McLaren on the brakes for the tight right-hander at the end of the top straight. And now there's a left-hander that follows it. Wurtz looking at the right and now at the left and now he goes by and meanwhile Dave is down in the pits with the unfortunate Peter Cox he sees me put the indicator on the left so I think he lets me go by and suddenly he turns in really hard and he hits me on the left rear wheel and I don't know what I could I cannot judge but people say he turned in so hard that it was almost like it was on purpose that he turned in so hard so I don't know I I just tried to do my best and now I have this problem again, so it doesn't work too well for us at the moment. Well, the other Schnitzer McLaren's in the pits. JJ Leto out of the car and into the car is Steve Soper. Leto running around in the pit lane. Now he's gone back to the cockpit to help Steve Soper get himself into that awkward central seat in the three-seater cockpit of the McLaren. There's the Paynos. That's the Wallace Weaver car. They're 17th. Their teammates McCarthy and Brabham are now 13th. And that's Yannick Dalmas waiting to take over from Alan McNish, who's got his works Porsche into sixth place. Meanwhile, Steve Soper running third in that leading McLaren behind the two Mercedes. Let's hear from the man who's got it up in third place, JJ Leto. Mercedes is going so fast that we have to go flat out all the time. And uh, really, our only advantage at the moment is that we have such a good tyre, which is lasting a lot. So Steve is uh, doing the third stint already with the same tyre. Oh, there's one of the GT2 Porsches getting it very wrong on that long downhill right-hander. Uh, that's the Spanish Kramer car getting back on the tarmac. Here's a GT2 Porsche creeping to the pits with its winker going, but he's well on the racing line and has to swerve as the leader comes by. Meanwhile, coming into the pits is Alan McNish to hand over to Yannick Dalmas in that sixth place. Works Porsche, McNish doing a very good job in his first drive for the Works Porsche team. That's him with the tartan on the top of his white helmet. Still Mercedes one and two, McLaren three, Mercedes four, and in the gravel is the Chamberlain Viper, Almo Capelli has got that car well and truly beached as the yellow flags wave. And we've got the leader in the pits. The leader in the pits, and he shouldn't be in the pits. This is an unscheduled pit stop for the leading Schneider Alex Wurtz Mercedes. And that's good news for this man. The number eight McLaren, Steve Soper at the wheel, goes up into second place. The Klaus Ludwig Bernd Maylander Mercedes now leads. The Steve Soper JJ Leto McLaren up to second. And in third place now, the Marcel Thiemann Alessandro Nanini Mercedes. That car still stationary in the pits. This is a delay for Bernd Schneider. What will the Mercedes men's tactics be now? Maybe I jumped on another car because now Klaus Ludwig is leading and I have to I have to do some points and uh, if that car is still leading in the end, maybe I jump in that one. Yes, the rules in the GT Championship allow a driver, if his car stops, to get into another car and still score points with that car's final position as long as he drives it for at least an hour. Well, it's still Mercedes leading, Klaus Ludwig, the red mirrored car, the Klaus Ludwig Bernd Maylander car is in the lead, the McLaren of Steve Soper and JJ Leto in second place, keeping about the same gap back to it, not catching but not losing the now leading Mercedes. And we wait to see whether Mercedes will bring that car in and put their driver's championship challenger, Bernd Schneider, in the car. Of course, J.J. Leto and Steve Soper hope they won't, because it's J.J. Leto and Steve Soper who currently lead the championship. There's another McLaren off, another Garth McLaren off. That's Thomas Bescher, who seems to have spun. He gets the car back onto the track, takes a lot of gravel and dust with him. And that Viper is the Beretta Gash car in second place in GT2. The Ortelli Porsche still leads GT2, with the Marcos gallantly plodding on in third place, and Dieter Cuesta and Justin Bell in fourth spot. And that is the GT2 leading Porsche, and we've had driver changes here because both Bruno Eichmann and Claudia Hertgen have moved out of their own car into this to score driver points. Claudia Hertgen now at the wheel, and we've got the leading Mercedes coming into the pits now, and out gets Klaus Ludwig, and indeed in gets 
uh, if he can clamber aboard. Now he manages to do it. They've had to change the seat because they're different sizes. That is Bert Schneider. Bert Schneider gets into the leading car. That's the Steve Soper McLaren, which has come in early. I gather a rear wheel was loose, and that brought Steve in earlier than he should have come in, and that's dropped him to third behind the Nanini Tiemann Mercedes. The Viper of Philippe Gash comes in. This is the second-placed car in GT2, remember. It's tremendously hot inside these cockpits. Water for Philippe Gash. Uh, he hasn't got a straw. He's just pouring the water down over all over his face because it's tremendously hot in these closed, confined spaces, particularly in the front-engine cars like the Paynos and the Viper. Now we've got the Mercedes with the red mirrors in the lead. This is the Klaus Ludwig car now being driven by Bernd Schneider, and Bernd Schneider's superb sports car driver that he is is comfortably in the lead. The Mercedes with yellow mirrors, the car that he started in, is is still running and it's in sixth place but that's the Pedro Chavez Rook Racing Porsche being wheeled away. Here in the Paynos pit, Dave Price and Perry McCarthy look pretty happy. Both the Paynos cars are running in 12th and 13th places. Mercedes in the lead, that is Bernd Schneider in the Ludwig Maylander car. The Nanini team of Mercedes is in second place. After their early stops, Sofa and Leto third in the McLaren. We're watching now the GT2 leader, that's Claudia Hertgen, waving by the Paynos. You could see her uh, giving it a hand signal to let that big grumbling Paynos go by. We've got in fourth place the McLaren of Olofsson and Raffanel, fifth place the Boots and Wallet Porsche, and the third Mercedes, the one that was delayed of Schneider and Wurz is in sixth place, but into the pits now comes once more the Philip Gash uh, Viper, he's got the door open, I think because he's so hot inside, but this is an unscheduled stop, and they can't restart it. It's a very hot car, and it doesn't want to start. It's got 10 cylinders and 8 litres in there, and none of them want to chime in, and that means that his chance of catching this car, the GT2 leader of Claudia Hertgen and Bruno Eichmann, is now dwindling away. There's Gash, he's back on the circuit now, they got it started, and just ahead of him, still going well, David Brabham in that Paynos running just outside the top ten. And in among all that traffic is the leading Mercedes. He's got a big lead now, has Bernd Schneider, and he's going to make absolutely sure that he doesn't have a traffic accident this late in the race. We've seen it happen before. We've seen it happen to Peter Cox, among others, in this race. And so, waiting his time to go past that Viper, now he does so. That's Bernd Schneider on his way. Alex Wurz, probably the fastest man on the circuit at the moment, in sixth place in the car that he has shared earlier in the race with that man, Bert Schneider. And some more smoke, some more fire. That's the Marcos. That's a shame because Cor Euser and Harold Becker had been doing a wonderful job of having that somewhat vintage motor car running in third place in GT2. And it looks as though their race in these closing stages has come to an end. Now, Steve Soper in third place overall. That's the Wallet Boots and Porsche in sixth place that Steve is lapping in the McLaren, two Mercedes ahead of him, and there's the Mercedes of Alexander Furtz, which is storming up through the field. He's about to lap Emmanuel Collard's GT1 Porsche, lining up to do so, weaving under braking, but the car that Furtz is really interested in is the blue and orange McLaren ahead of him, because that is the Olofsson Raphael car in fourth place. Furtz, after that earlier delay, is running fifth, but there's a Mercedes going slow. That was a shot, very briefly, of uh, that's the second place Mercedes, and it is coming to a halt. And that's going to allow Steve Soper to take the white McLaren, the Schnitzer BMW McLaren, up into second place. I can see him from here. He's managed to get the car underway again, but it's going very, very slowly. Still, of course, the Schneider Ludwig Maylander car leads. And a further lap back, this battle between Wurz's Mercedes and Olofsson's McLaren goes on. Olofsson just ahead. They've got a slower GT2 Porsche ahead of them. And now Wurz charges up the inside. Is the GT2 Porsche in the way? No, the Mercedes goes between the two of them. And Olofsson has to give best. Wurz is fourth, and Olofsson down to fifth. Worried faces in the Mercedes pit. But now we've got 
Steve Soper in the pit lane. We're not due to have a pit stop from him. He's in second place. Steve Soper in the dying moments of this race. Steve Soper is in the pits and they're refueling the car. It's a last minute splash and dash pit stop. And while they're there, Marcel Thiemann has taken the faltering Mercedes-Benz, which seems now to be firing on all cylinders, back into second place. Steve Soper rejoins after that brief pit stop, but it was enough to drop him back now into third place. The Alessandra Nanini Marcel team and Mercedes is back up to second, and while all this drama is going on, still at the front of the field, Bert Schneider in the Klaus Ludwig Bert Maylander car, Norbert Haug and the Mercedes team don't want to celebrate yet, but this is the final lap, and Bert Schneider has 10 lovely championship points waiting for him and for the Mercedes team as he comes over the brow into the final double right-hander. The battle-stained Mercedes CLK Coupe can now see the chequered flag. Bert Schneider accelerates onto the start-finish straight. The chequered flag waves. Mercedes-Benz celebrates as they win in Austria. One and two for Mercedes despite the last-minute dramas for the Nanini team and car. Sopa and Leto are on the podium again, but Schneider used two cars to win this race. Legal, but controversial. He was in trouble with his car and he did an outstanding job today and I think he, he deserves the 10 points. He was definitely the number one driver in the field and he did a, he did a fantastic job. So, plenty for Mercedes to celebrate then. First, second and fourth place. Here's the confirmation. And Leto and Soper again on the podium for BMW. McNish and Damas, they came home an excellent seventh in their Porsche. The Dave Price Paynos boys persevered in the heat, and they finished 11th and 12th. We showed some good pace at the end. We were only running two seconds slower than Mercedes. Um, yeah, I'm not slow. I'm not happy about running two seconds slower than Mercedes, but, you know, we're... We're making progress, so, you know, we, we keep trying. We're in for Britain. <laughs> and this is how the GT1 Drivers' Championship is affected. The McLaren duo Leto and Soper now just 10 points ahead of Mercedes' Bernd Schneider. Justin Bau seems happy enough with third place in the GT2 class. But with Bruno Eichmann and Claudia Hertgen switching cars, he drops to third in the championship table. So that's how the GT Championships stand. But a reminder before we go of that great news for Britain in Formula 3000. Jamie Davis is top of the tree in the championship. Can he stay there? Find out when you join us again in a...